So today you decided to be a car collector. So we're going to talk about how you're going to screw it up. So it's official. You woke up today and you decided you want to be a collector and not just a muscle car collector antiques, but you want to go big, real big collecting supercars. Maybe you just won the lottery. You came into some money or instead of being smart and getting into like real estate or business, you want to show off your collection, maybe open a museum. I, I don't know who knows. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to help you get there. And the good news is you are not alone. If you do any amount of research, you'll find tons of people from all walks of life that want to collect on some level. Maybe it's just a certain make or model. Others who keep their options open and some have huge collections, some that have millions of followers on social media. You'll be happy to know there's also a strong supporting business model as well. A wide swath of companies and individuals that curate, assess, and acquire cars, even collections. And they make a good income doing it while making owners very, very happy. And if you're looking to broaden your horizons, that's a great place to start. There are even groups on social media that have different levels of dedication. And those are a lot of places where you can learn how to do it wrong as well. And the reason I say that and even bring this up is because of something that breaks my heart on a regular basis. Say you're a new collector, you hit the ground running, you purchase five or six cars. And after a, a couple of roadblocks, you finally go to a professional who says your collection isn't worth anything. Start over. And it sucks. It, it, it comes up more times than I even care to admit. And why? Because we buy from the heart, not with our head. We've never been trained on at least the basics of it. And there's a ton of different areas and pitfalls between buying a car you'll drive and buying the car you'll collect. Finding a collector car is like saying you need to move the force so you can pick out the right tree. How do you find that well-made needle in a stack of mediocre needles? See, purchasing a regular car, it's a fairly simple, straightforward, but a supercar isn't just looking for the badge on the bonnet. It goes a lot deeper, and because unlike a regular car, supercars are usually well taken care of with great upkeep, and they're all built with that wow factor in mind. But before I start, I need to add this. This is not a replacement for specific advice from an automotive professional associated with the field of your particular investment or the vehicle you're purchasing. This is the 30,000 foot view and should be treated as such. In fact, you can say this is advisement to find a professional that can help you make the best decision possible. Exhaust all your research options before you buy and remember caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware. And with that said, let's get into it. Uh, it's the most basic part of buying a car and still it's the most overlooked. The perception is twofold. It's first trusting a seller that may be even more naive as you are. And the idea that because a car comes from a particular source, that it must be of quality. The reality is even the most well-built supercar can have a history of issues like any other car. Some even most meticulous connoisseurs can miss. Knowing what you should know before you know is key. More times than not, it's asking about something that has been replaced that hasn't even broken yet. The key being yet. There are obvious issues such as damage, rot, and rust, but supercars are known for meticulous upkeep and environmental garages. So the truth is this problem could be hiding. Now this is a big part of the process and anybody who sold any sort of supercar knows it well. So don't overlook it. It, be it becomes the very foundation of the research you're doing. And if a seller minimizes that it's an instant red flag. So double down. The good news is problems are oftentimes well documented and there is a key component to help you identify them. It's called the PPI. It's a pre-purchase inspection and it's the vaccine path of the expert. A shop associated with the type of car you're purchasing 
charges a minimal fee to assess the vehicle and what repairs it would need. I, I know this part may sound a little tedious and asking why you're spending extra money on a car you plan to purchase anyway, but when you find out too late that the repair bill is $20,000 or higher, you'll soon realize how important this step can be. Seriously, ask around and listen to the horror stories and you'll know exactly why people invest in PPIs. I need to add a little word on aftermarket here as well. Aftermarket is generally considered cheap, but tasteful aftermarket such as professional race cars used by manufacturing teams, high-end manufacturing supported companies, or honored builders can have exceptions to the rule. So you don't have to completely rule this one out, but be aware that it will add a level of scrutiny to the vehicle. I think this is why most try to avoid that. You'll hear a lot about keeping it original and there's nothing wrong with the approach either. We'll get more into exceptions later, but as a general rule, something like a custom wide body isn't by nature going to be a beloved museum piece and may actually generate ire to the purists, especially if it's a cheap copy of a beloved car that's worth a lot more. I'm looking at you Porsche guys. Myself, I don't mind the idea of tearing apart a cheap rebuild title car to make something creative and adding some sort of value to it, but just make sure you understand these are usually passion projects and not collective potential. The next step on our path is thinking about performance, and that's not just about horsepower, but the quality of the build. Hand-built, top quality building materials, real wood veneers, th these are the top of that list. It wouldn't hurt if the car was the fastest in the world at some point either. A great example being the McLaren F1. Considered the fastest car in the world for more than a decade. Came with custom luggage, a car that used gold for its heat shield, among a library of other things. And that is just a recipe for a collector. Cars that were considered expensive yet broke easy, were considered disposable, they're not going to hold their value. But Inversely, a reliable vehicle will undoubtedly have some someone that loves it somewhere. And this goes double for trim levels as well. The V12 limited edition model is probably going to be more noteworthy than the entry level four cylinder of the same model. And if it's a roadworthy concept car, it's almost guaranteed to pull in more than its stable mates. This is an area a buyer can sneak in some good buys if they know what they're looking for. Knowing a car had a unique trim level or option that the VIN research won't pull up could mean a find that nobody knows about and basically steal a car that is worth much more. In fact, many of the cars that you'll see in a collection are there because they have some level of performance or option that no other vehicle in their sector has. So back in the day, this was really no big deal. Nobody drove their cars, but today it's becoming more and more of a pivot point that needs attention. If you want a car to be a collector, you won't want to drive it. Every mile is a ding on the old chronometer. Some cars have packed in buffers or may be notable for their excessive mileage, but even then nobody will ever argue that a car with 10 verified miles on the clock is going to be worth more than the same car with say a hundred thousand miles and let's be honest the 10 mile car it probably doesn't have any hiccups either i mean it can't break if it's never had a chance to be broken and no wear and tear means no worries about hidden corrective issues and it's more than likely 100 percent original it's why barn finds are so loved because you can almost guarantee the car has been hiding away from the elements with no mileage and generally needs very little investment before it hits an auction block so i've always laughed at this limited edition badge on most cars but when it comes to true supercar collecting how many were made is indeed part of the equation unique trims concept cars they all fall into this category you can almost guarantee that the most expensive cars out there were performance-based vehicles that are at most in the double digits over their entire model run it's the very basis of supply and demand if even if a car isn't all that great, if only a few were made, there's a good chance that it has some sort of protective buffer to its value. And there's no hard or fast number, but getting into the thousands, you'll start to see depreciation. The 10,000 mark is a supercar is considered common and 
20,000 might as well be mass produced. So let's think of cars like people. Sure, there's millions out there, but how do we say one human has more value than another? It's not because of beauty or how much they can lift or run, right? Well, it's pretty simple. We measure them by their accomplishments. When the Bugatti was built, it was built with the intentions of being the fastest car in the world. And today you still know that name because it accomplished that goal. Homologated vehicles, cars that were built specifically for the brand to compete in racing are like secret weapons. It means a company only built enough to race and usually did little to change them from their race car counterparts. These litter the floor of museums just because of it. They didn't even have to win either. Other accomplishments could be featured in a major film, was the first to do something or was a prototype that ended up somehow making it to the street. What's great about noteworthy cars is they defy other rules. The 250 GT in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, it wasn't even a real Ferrari, but it still netted money. The Countach in The Wolf of Wall Street was a huge pile of destroyed car that sold in the millions. The Toyota Supra, a car that is in no way particular noteworthy vehicle prior to the turn of the century, was featured in the Fast and Furious and that very car, which wasn't even effectively the best kind of super out there, sold at auction for $550,000. The problem, what you have to watch here is for the arbitrary or weird noteworthy concept. You'll constantly hear that this car was only one version of this particular color or the car was the wife of a famous person. I had someone try to sell me a W220 Mercedes for three times its value because it was owned by a famous shock jock. And that's at best coffee table conversation. Nobody cares. And, and, and that really brings me to my last point. The truth is just because a car dinged all the boxes before this one, no matter how much you love it, if nobody wants it, it's dead in the water. Worse off, there's no rhyme or reason why one car with similar statistics of another car finds success while the latter gets thrown into the bargain bin. People like what they like. And it's only as valuable as someone who is willing to pay for it. If nobody wants it, it's a paperweight. Some cars are top end performance oriented, making 600 horsepower, but there are a hundred thousand of them on the streets. So you can pick one up for the 10th of its original price and even less if they aren't reliable. Contrast that to a 2005, 2006 Ford GT, a retro car. They made 4,038 models, which is kind of a lot for a production run yet they still keep climbing in value and the more go out of circulation the higher that price is going to get and even though this may seem like a wild card picking these unique vehicles out is one thing that will show you if you really have what it takes to collect this is by no means the be all end all guide in fact i've barely scratched the surface but i try to sort things in an order of value that is ultimately how you're going to want to think when you start researching your collector car and when it comes to collecting the big trick is not to treat it like ownership you have to treat it like an investment the point is to turn a profit and if you've ever lived through three oil shortages like i did you'll know why a car loses money and why right now the inverse is happening why collectors are buying up anything with a stick shift and gas power. The sharks are seeing the blood in the water. But just like those bad investments made back in the 70s and 80s, we know that history truly does repeat itself. So knowing when to sell is just as important as knowing when to buy. And I just I want to let you know, today I taught you something I personally hate. Our old saying was we weren't selling a car so much as finding a new garage for it. And if I'm being honest, it kind of made me sick to my stomach and it got me into imports and cheap Porsches. As the nineties came to a close that started to change. We started to see more and more owners going from garage buyers to street drivers, the advent of rallies and cars and coffees. It meant people were coming out and sharing their cars. We love and value cars like the Ferrari 360 and the Lamborghini Diablo so much because we saw them in action. And that gave rise to new buyers who went to 430s and Murcia Lagos and onto Italias and Gallardos. They didn't see these cars as investments like money anymore, but as an investment of experience. And they got bigger return than any check could write. So what I hope is that you find a car from passion and you drive it because you love it. And 
that's never a good investment. Maybe you just have your collection on the side, but I think our community and its crazy value system will change once we can have fun with our cars. Every day I see more and more buyers driving their cars and that's prompting manufacturers to make more. Investing in stuff like aftermarket, bespoke design that will improve the vehicles they drive and make this experience so much more refreshing and unique. A place we all can sit down and share our identity in our automotive choices the same way we guys used to, you know, before the advent of social media splitting us up. The real moral of this story is that the value of each car you own is created by you, the owner. The stories you create and the passion you share being true value to each person you touch with it, from the kid that looks on wide-eyed to the first day they pulled off the cover and you took delivery. It's a journey we all took, and tomorrow, if it all goes away, we still have those stories. And that... That's what's really priceless. So thank you for tuning in. And I hope you liked the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Look at all the store for apparel. Even if you can't afford a supercar, at least you can look the part and show your love for the supercar world. Awesome colognes, awesome different options. Check it out in our store. As for me, I'm going on a drive and consider what video I'm going to make next. But that is going to be for the next video. See you then.